My name is Nas, and I'm glad to be your host here. Welcome to today's episode of our ITEP Connect series, which is the third session that we are pleased to bring you in collaboration with SAP. For those of you who did not manage to join us for the third 24th session, which focuses on discrete manufacturing, you may view the recording on our ITEP Connect website. Today's session focuses on process manufacturing, which covers industries like oil and gas, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and F&B. Without further ado, please welcome Nikhil Chaturvedi, Vice President, Energy and Natural Resources at SAP Asia Pacific. He will deliver his keynote that will set the context for our panel discussion that follows. Thank you, Naz. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we are very thankful to you that you have joined this uh, session on Industry 4.0 for Process Manufacturing. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Hanover Messe Asia Pacific IT team for organizing this event. Uh, special thanks to, uh, to Naz, Jane Xiao, Alicia, uh, and Denise, and uh, Yvonne from our SAP site for organizing this uh, uh, this uh, event or web conference. Uh, secondly, I would like to also thank all the panelists who have agreed to take out time from their busy schedules. And you would see uh, an excellent panel discussion later on about the adoption of Industry 4.0. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank all of you who have uh, decided to join this event and, and hopefully you would get good value out of the entire event. Now, what's the context? Why did we think about this industry 4.0 for process uh, manufacturing? When, uh, whenever we think about industry 4.0, the first idea that comes to our minds is discrete manufacturing, smart factories, assembly line operations, IT and OT integration, etc. But for process manufacturing companies like oil and gas, chemicals, life sciences, mining and metals, food and beverages, the consumer products, it's an equally important uh, and, and a very interesting uh, area from where the uh, efficiencies can be gained uh, by the process manufacturing companies. And hence, we thought of uh, putting this particular event for you together. So in this keynote speech, I would like to specifically talk about what are the possibilities of Industry 4.0? What are the various types of manifestations on how this technology can help uh, process manufacturing companies? And then, and, and what is the, a better way than sharing it through some case studies and customer examples of how companies have adopted it globally? So with that, I would like to share my screen. Please wait for a second. All right, so, so our topic today is new value and possibilities with Industry 4.0. I'm sure some of you uh, would have identified uh, with, their own, with your own organization's uh, initiatives in this area. Please also feel free to post your questions and comments in the chat box. We'll monitor them and use them during the panel discussion and the Q&A session later on. So please make it interactive. Now, first of all, why are process manufacturing companies really adopting industry 4.0. What is so special about it? Definitely cost reduction is an important objective. Uh, efficiency optimization is definitely a very big objective. But on the right hand side, you see some of the important uh, drivers which are really playing an important role. As you know, most of the product companies are now offering different types of service options. So products as, as, uh, as a service. So that servitization is a very important area why process companies are trying to adopt this industry 4.0 on how they can offer their products as a service. I will share an example of Sika specialty chemicals later on, which substantiate this particular driver. Secondly, optimization in terms of resources, energy, et cetera, to make their themselves more sustainable and, and more profitable as well. 
And I'll share some examples. For example, of Severstal, a Russian steel company, later on to substantiate that. Then individualization or lot size of one. We have been hearing often about lot size of one in discrete manufacturing, but in process manufacturing as well, there is a large extent of uh, individualization which is now happening, for example, in paints area, in inks manufacturing, in agrochemicals and so on. So that customization and individualization are becoming very important topics. So these are some of the important drivers that are uh, uh, helping in, in industry 4.0 adoption in process industries. Now, if there you... is a huge value creation potential for chemical companies transforming towards industry 4.0. According to McKinsey, digital can give chemical companies the power to unlock more than $200 billion of new value by reducing costs to serve, improving pricing, and capturing growth from competitors. And similarly, for mill industries also, uh, almost 70% of these manufacturers are now pursuing smart factory initiatives uh, as per a study uh, conducted by Capgemini. And many of them have already started investing, almost one third of them have started investing into uh, smart factories or smart plants during the last one and a half to two years. So there is a lot of investment going in this area and we will see some of the benefits for chemicals and mill industries in a short while. Now, how does SAP support this industry 4.0? Our objective is to develop intelligent enterprises and there are four major pillars on which our industry 4.0 uh, philosophy rests. One is intelligent products, the other is intelligent facilities, and then we have intelligent assets and empowered people. In, over the course of our discussion today, we will see some of these examples being substantiated. And, and this leverages various types of technologies. Some of them are mentioned here, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data management, analytics, uh, IT and OT integration, uh, IoT, robotics, drones, etc. And our objective is to provide seamless integration from L1 level to L5 level, uh, from IoT uh, enabled sensors point of view, which come from our partner organizations, and then integrating them with the uh, level two automation SCADA and DCS systems, level three manufacturing operations management or MES systems, Level four SAP, uh, SAP ERP, uh, which is a core uh, solution of uh, SAP, with some partnerships like with Honeywell, Aspen Tech, uh, and Hexagon, etc. And level five, which is the business intelligence and dashboards, etc. So, so it's an integrated landscape that we want to uh, achieve and provide to our uh, customers so that they can really benefit from the industry 4.0 I think the following examples would really help in understanding uh, how other companies globally are adopting industry 4.0 uh, initiatives. So let's talk about this specialty chemical manufacturer from Switzerland. Their name is uh, Sika, and they have uh, automated tank management and stock replenishment solution that they have developed. Uh, it would be useful for several companies who are planning to manage their tanks tank farms uh, for their own premises, as well as for their customer premises where you are providing vendor managed inventory solutions. So let me walk you through uh, some of these uh, cases on how scenarios that they have uh, adopted here. So Sika have uh, installed or implemented tanks in their customer organization. So what they have done is, uh, using these IoT enabled sensors, they are getting the sensor data and monitoring the tank details uh, uh, as in the uh, stock level, temperature, pressure, uh, etc. Uh, they are doing live monitoring and at the same time they are getting alerts if the tolerance limits are breached in terms of temperature, pressure or other parameters. Uh, so first of all, customers have direct visibility. Sika themselves definitely have direct visibility and there is an automated system that when a tank level or inventory level goes down to the reorder level, then it is automatically order replenishment is done and it is 
dispatch to the customer organization. So you can see it's a very good combination or integration of IT and uh, OT. And there are several benefits that you can see over here, like their tank efficiency, tank utilization has improved. Uh, the problem detection is on a real-time basis, so their downtime gets significantly reduced. And they can also uh, simplify and automate and make their order uh, replenishment far more efficient. So this is a good example of how you can improve your efficiencies using uh, Industry 4.0. Now I'd like to share one more example of uh, Elvis. Elvis uh, is, is a German company who uh, have used uh, Industry 4.0 for predictive quality management. And especially in uh, our batch manufacturing scenarios where predictive quality or quality management is uh, extremely important. If you can predict, then it will be even more uh, uh, better for the companies. So in this case, what they have done is there is a lot of machine data or equipment data, which is uh, coming almost to the extent of three to five TB uh, uh, data is coming over here from the sensors and, and other MES systems, which they host in the uh, uh, HANA platform system of SAP. And at the same time, there is a lot of data, process related data, for example, the process orders, uh, equipment hierarchy, all the ERP related data, uh, recipes, etc., which is coming from uh, SAP ERP solution. And on the other hand, this machine equipment data like temperature, pressure, flow rate, vibrations, etc., they are coming. So they amalgamate this data here and uh, then using the algorithms, machine learning algorithms, they uh, what they have done is they take the quality data of off spec products in the past. And that's how the model was trained. The data was, uh, was taken and regression analysis was done. And now based on that, uh, they know what kind of quality risk areas exist. And using those uh, quality risk areas, now it is uh, used to predict any off-spec products coming so that we can take corrective action in time and save money and reputation in the eyes of customers immediately for the company. So this is another possibility where many process manufacturing companies can uh, utilize Industry 4.0. Another very important area for Industry 4.0 is the electricity or energy management. So Severstal, which is a uh, which is the largest steel manufacturing company of uh, of Russia, they uh, have uh, around 250 to 300 million dollars of annual electricity cost and as some of you would know in steel industry apart from raw materials ten, uh, almost 10 percent of their electricity uh, or their cost comes through electricity bills and and they were facing almost 12 million dollars of losses per annum just because of the imbalances because for steel plants there is uh, there is a power purchase agreement with electricity company and there is a uh, allowed band and beyond that band there is some degree of deviation in electricity consumption, which is allowed, say 3.5% or so. If the deviation is more than that, they have to pay penalties. In this case, Severstal had no way of monitoring their, uh, their deviations, and they used to get the bill penalty bill directly uh, at the end of the month from, from the utility or the, from the electricity company. So with the help of uh, SAP solutions, we developed a cockpit for them, which is like electricity consumption monitoring tool, uh, where they could see the planned uh, electricity uh, agreement and the actual consumption so far and the real time consumption as in now. So they are able to find out where are the real time errors? Uh, are they in uh, a particular meter or a substation or a transformer? So within the planned premises, the entire equipment hierarchy, as you can see here in this left panel, they can see which particular area has got deviation over or under the tolerance limit. So this has helped them in reducing these losses to a great extent. Uh, you will also see a link for the video here. We will share these slides with you. So please feel free to uh, watch that video on YouTube where they explain how uh, they have been able to reduce the uh, electricity penalties. 
and you can also uh, use industry 4.0 to uh, improve a very uh, important area which is of employee safety worker safety and plant safety this is for uh, a company named nlmk it's a steel company in uh, based out of russia and they have used the uh, sap and various other technologies to improve their uh, worker safety and plant safety quite significantly so i'll play this video and uh, i hope you will like the unique innovative concepts that they have deployed here To work out the technologies that were needed for the worker positioning system, a continuous hot dip galvanizing unit was chosen, since this is one of the most difficult pieces of equipment to test. The unit consists of many technical levels and galleries, and it is equipped with devices for working with chemicals. The positioning system displays the movement of employees and changes in unit operation modes in real time, and it reports all possible emergency situations to the management. How does it work? At the beginning of the working day, the employee secures the sensor tag to his arm or clothes, and all of his activities are recorded in the system until the end of his shift. Each employee is assigned zones where he is allowed to work. If the employee leaves the boundary of a permitted area, the system will alert the managers of the violation. The sensor also vibrates and transmits a notification to the system if an employee enters a potentially hazardous area. In the event of an abnormal situation, for example, a rise in temperature, the zone is automatically marked as dangerous and the system notifies all nearby specialists about it. The sensors are equipped with a button that allows employees to quickly call for help in case they become ill or are injured. The device automatically detects unusual behavior, immobility, falls, abrupt changes in body position. Everything that the unit records in real time is displayed in one convenient dashboard. Each manager is able to configure a custom list of monitored events. We are able to see the complete picture of what is happening and to react promptly to possible incidents. We hope this will improve the safety of production. The employee positioning system is the first joint step taken by SAP and LMK in the field of innovative solutions for industry. Now the laboratory is working on ways to optimize finances and production. These solutions will help companies to significantly reduce costs and reach a new level of competitiveness. So I hope uh, this video would have given you some ideas about uh, immense possibilities of Industry 4.0 in the area of cost-effective, safe, efficient uh, plant operations. Uh, we have extended this concept not just within the plant boundaries, but to the uh, including the uh, workforce as well as for supply chain, uh, both inbound and outbound. Uh, we'll get some more insights into this. So that brings an end to my uh, keynote speech. We'll be very happy to get some comments from you or uh, please contact us later on. Now I'll wear my second hat and move into... Uh, the, into the panel discussion. So I would like to welcome all the panelists for uh, for the next next session. All right. Thank you, Nikhil, for the insightful presentation that sets the context for our following panel discussion. Before we proceed to the panel, we would like to run a quick audience poll to better understand uh, to better understand. where you are joining us from, your interest areas, and your key concerns with industrial transformation. They are quite simple questions, so let's take a few moments to make sure everybody has a chance to look through the options. The first question being, which countries do you come from? Uh, where are you based from? And then the second question being, what are your objectives for attending this episode? What would you like to achieve? What would you like to learn from after attending this episode. And then the two questions being, what are your key concerns and challenges in adopting Industry 4.0 solutions in your business? Okay, let's take a look at the results now. 
So as I can see, most of you come from Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand or Philippines. Some of you do come from Singapore. And then there are a few from South, East, South Asia, uh, India, Pakistan or Sri Lanka. And as for the second question, you, most of you would like to learn more about the topic and gain insights that can be applied to your current business, identify business opportunities, or hear specific individuals speak on the topic. And as for the third question, your key concern is cost of transformation is too high and you cannot afford a full-scale transformation. Or the, you know, the skills of your employees are too uh, inadequate or not compatible with Industry 4.0 or you are not very sure where to start your transformation journey. So this will be helpful for our speakers to better understand our audience's concerns and attune their examples and talking points accordingly. So now, let's bring on our panel speakers now. They are Manoj Kumar, Head of IT at HPCL Metal Energy Limited, Richard Kusuma, Commercial Director at PT Food Dex, in the ingredients in Indonesia. Andrew McLean, Innovation and Operational Excellence Advisor, Researcher and Educator at Dolphin Dynamics Lab in Singapore and Australia. Manoj Narang, Asia Pacific Leader, IBU Chemicals at SAP. And Jeff Majestic, Head of Digital Supply Chain Center of Excellence at SAP, Asia Pacific, and Japan. We have a great lineup of speakers, so we do encourage you to ask them questions using the Q&A forum. We will tackle your questions at the end of today's session. Nikhil will now switch gears and continue to spearhead the discussion as he moderates the panel. Nikhil, back to you. Thank you, Naz. Uh, yes, I have indeed changed my hat now. So, uh, Nippon, uh, moderator now for the panel discussion. Uh, so once again, thanks to the panelists. And, and as Nas said, please uh, post your questions in the chat. Uh, some of the audience had uh, sent their questions at the time of registration. So we have already included them here. Okay. So uh, let's start the panel discussion. And now, first of all, I would like to uh, pose a question to Mr. Jeff Majestic. Uh, Jeff, could you please tell us what's different or unique about process manufacturing companies compared to discrete manufacturing uh, which make our industry 4.0 approach different from discrete okay thank you nikhil um yeah this this conversation brings me back um actually to my start of my professional career um i worked in the um for a finnish provider of hardware and software in the in the paper industry um, and, and one of the things which really stuck out in my mind um, as, a, as a new professional um, in the business was, um, was really, you know, I said, you know, is it difficult to make paper? And the answer was, no, it's not. It's very difficult to make good quality paper on a repetitive basis. And I think that that kind of start for me was, was really just trying to understand as well and, and all the nuances with the process industry. Um, you know, every step has to be executed um, flawlessly. Um, once something is kind of, you know, in route or in, or, or in production, you know, you can't take it back out. Um, and, and being part of many startups and paper mills and all that stuff, I got to experience that, that firsthand. So, um, um, so this is kind of a, an old passion of mine. But when we look at this from the, um, the process industries compared to discrete, um, while there's similarities, I think there's a couple of things which really stand out to me, which are um, maybe more of a focus or more of a priority, um, maybe even a challenge. And I think later on, we'll talk about the opportunity. Um, and one is you touched upon that opening around um, safety. Um, not that discrete industries and their manufacturing plants don't focus on safety. Um, frankly speaking, they don't have a, a tendency to blow up. Um, which, which can happen sometimes in, uh, in, in the process industry. We've seen that across the world. So safety is something that I think is more of a focus for organizations, um, not only the human side of it, but facility side. Um, dealing with regulations, whether you're in life sciences, um, consumer products, um, you know, mill mining, regulations in your op companies you operate in, um, are, they never end and they always change. 
And that also changes the way how you have to run your business. And I think the third thing now, which we're seeing more and more is around um, the traceability and, and kind of the accountability when it comes into, you know, where you're sourcing the raw materials, um, the vendors you're, you're working with, and all the way through, you know, through the, the logistics process into your finished goods. So I think, again, it's, there's a lot of similarities, but I think the three which really stand out to me where it's much more of a focus and challenges around, um, around the safety aspect, um, the, um, the traceability and that transparency, um, as well as the regulatory. Very nice, Jeff. Thank you so much for giving such a good start. And yes, three very important parameters, safety, governance and regulations and, and traceability. Uh, Mr. Manoj Narang, would you like to add anything to that about the uniqueness of uh, process manufacturing compared to discrete? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Nikhil. Uh, from my perspective, I think first and foremost is when you look at process manufacturing, there are limited number of raw materials, but getting many products. Like if you crack naphtha, you get many uh, products out of it. Uh, the kind of product which are sometimes incidental to the production, like byproducts, co-product, they're very specific to the uh, you know process manufacturing. Another point is uh, the irreversibility of the material as it transforms in the process manufacturing. You cannot de-unassemble kind of a thing. You react, you process, there is a formulation and you get a product. So as you do this kind of a processing, there is a precise process control which is required and the property and the yield which you get from the product is based on the process condition, the purity, the quality of the raw material which you use and other factors. So therefore there is a lot of complexity involved in process manufacturing, which may, which is due to the processing due to the materials and which is also depending on the skills of the operator because skills is very important. Uh, the chemical, man, uh, any process manufacturing requires skilled uh, employee to understand which temperature to be kept, which pressure, which conditions leads to which kind of, you know, uh, kind of a thing. Another important point which you see in process is the campaigns. The, some campaigns means that you, uh, because of the property of the material, you have to run them into something called product wheels. Uh, like, you know, in the case of polymers, you run them in a cycle uh, from a lower MFI to a higher MFI or like in a color run, uh, lighter color, then going into uh, more into the uh, darker side of it. So, so those kind of very specific campaign planning, the process manufacturing, execution control kind of a thing, uh, the number of less number of uh, inputs, uh, also the traceability, Jeff talked about uh, the safety aspect, which he talked about. And important thing is in process manufacturing, it is throughput, the processing speed uh, at which we process, not the cycle time. There are two different things. So these are some different points from process manufacturing perspective. Thank you. Very nice, uh, Manoj. Thank you so much for giving that additional insight about uh, process manufacturing in addition to what Jeff had already mentioned. So with that background, now let, let's move to the next question. And this question is like three in one, three questions rolled into one because they are so closely associated with each other. And I would like to start with Andrew first. Andrew, could you please share some insights uh, with us about these three things closely associated? First of all, in your customers' organizations, what kind of technologies you have seen uh, being adopted, industry 4.0 related technologies? Secondly, what were the use cases? I mean, what kind of scenarios were there? And thirdly, what benefits did the customers uh, or your organization achieve now? Sure, thanks, Nikhil. So if I just draw on my 15 years experience of working for two of the world's largest mining companies as a senior manager in operations and business improvement. I would like to say I've seen key technologies from you know, IoT and control systems, robotics, drones, lots of analytics, lots, you know, beginning to see more and more machine learning, uh, LIDAR robotics, digital twins, all of these things are starting to uh, starting to take prominent roles. And when it comes to use cases, I'd talk about the use cases from that operational excellence or business improvement mindset of, you know, the use cases around, and, you know, Jeff started us off in this direction around, you know, safety use cases. 
of how am I going to make sure my workers go home safe. Uh, and I also mentioned about the importance of throughput. We're an asset intensive industry in general in process. So, so a lot of solutions around how do we operate our assets to their full potential, so maximizing the OEE of our assets. We're operating increasingly more complex value chains. So how do we integrate these value chains? How do we predict downtime in our assets? That might be an unplanned or unscheduled failure, or it might be as organizations become better and better at maintenance, that amount of unscheduled downtime is getting less and less. It's actually the operational downtime where we end up with operating losses and rate losses that we're chasing. And then there's a whole lot of stuff around, you know, automating inspections, taking humans out of places where, where uh, you know, they're potentially in the line of fire. So using technologies like robotics and, and LIDAR to be able to capture images and inspect equipment, send that into the cloud and process that. So maybe if I just drill into one particular use case, and that is using uh, you know, mobile cloud, big data and AI together around the, the connected frontline worker and helping keep them safe. So I've been spending a lot of time over the past few years in safety transformations of where, how is it we help people understand what work they need to do, the tasks that they need to, to, to do those work. And it might be a major shut in a processing plant, for example, like a 72 hour shut. And that's where a lot of our high risk work happens. How do we, how do we assess the, the hazards and the risks and make sure the right controls are in place and then make sure we've got all of the right, uh, all of the right permits before we start that work. Now, what we were doing was we had all of this, this work, um, you know, controlled via paperwork. And the first generation of some of our industry 4.0 solutions here were effectively automating paperwork and they really didn't provide the benefits. It's only when we've come back around and started to you know, redesign, simplify and digitize and really rethink these things, are we starting to, to really see benefits of you know, improved quality of hazard assessments, you know, reducing the amount of time our teams spend on paperwork and waiting for approvals and more time on the tools. So more tool time, more productivity. We get our supervisors rather than driving from job to job to you to do manual approvals. They're doing approvals for work on large, on large processing plants, you know, uh, on a mobile device. And then another feature of our industry is particularly in our large maintenance shuts is we use a large number of contract workers. So these workers might come to us just for, you know, the three day maintenance shut and they may not come back to us for three or six months time or ever again. So we need to be on board these people with like smart mobile solutions that not only just digitize the work that they're doing, but actually start to help them and learn from other crews, maybe other operations you have and start making better suggestions to them on how they're going to manage their hazards and risks. And then we can move on to some of the productivity things that we like to do to help them stay informed during the shift, give them you know, real-time dashboards, real-time uh, updates on their tasks, et cetera. So for me, it's that mobile frontline, you know, solving the safety challenge, making sure everyone's going home safe, and then really engaging them where the paperwork world and, and perhaps some of the first generation of mobile solutions weren't really that helpful. And, and I think that's one of the more exciting parts of uh, Industry 4.0. And it's not about necessarily replacing people, it's about, you know, we're never gonna replace a lot of the, the people in our business with robots. I've implemented autom automated solutions and robotics, but there's so many tasks where we want a smart machine to work with a human. So we've actually got leveraging the best of both, both worlds with them. Thank you so much, Andrew. This was like 
really valuable information coming straight from the heart, straight from the uh, field level experience uh, with mining and metal companies, and I'm sure from many other industries. Uh, very useful. We take this question forward to uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar. Same question. Uh, in your organization, HMEL, what kind of technologies you have used for what use cases and what benefits you have seen out of that? Yeah, thanks, Nikhil. Uh, see, at uh, HMEL, you know, uh, we have categorized our technology into two parts. One is the foundation technologies, what we call it. Um, uh, namely, uh, SAP is one of them, which is our ERP system, core system, and various manufacturing execution system, you know, which normally require in any uh, oil and gas, especially the refinery company. So that's what we call as a foundation system. Okay, so the continuous improvement on those uh, technology, it's the DNA of uh, HMEL. Uh, so that's one piece. And the second is in terms of the new digital technology, what we call, you know, the from where the innovation will come. So the innovation, what we believe, there are seven technologies what we have identified at HMEL, starting from advanced analytics to industrial internet, internet of things, uh, robotic process automation, the chatbots, uh, the drone-related uh, uh, technology, and the augmented reality and the virtual reality. Those are the seven technology which we have identified, uh, which will create you know difference and create value for uh, HMEL. And in each category, we have initiated uh, some of the process. Uh, uh, for example, um, for internal logistics uh, to manage end-to-end -end manless, uh, we have initiated uh, you know the plant logistic management system, where right from the truck registration to the delivery, including the invoicing, you know uh, the uh, the truck driver he don't need to come down from his uh, lorry, okay, so he would be on his uh, lorry only and using the biometrics, the sensors, and the other technology, you know, and the way we have defined the route. Okay, the truck will be filled, the land would be generated, the invoice would be uh, uh, printed, you know, without, you know, uh, he getting a down from his uh, lorry. So that's one example. Uh, second, uh, I would like to mention about, uh, you know, the video analytics, we have executed our integrated physical security system, where, you know, the challenge, uh, the problem which we try to address is, you know, uh, we had more than four, 300 plus cameras in our uh, refinery, and we have a control room where people see the live footage, okay? And humanly, it is not possible that, okay, you know, though live, somebody could make out what's happening in those live footage because the camera also keep on shuffling, okay? So you are lucky if you are catching some uh, someone live, okay, if uh, something is going wrong. So using this video analytics, um, instead of uh, uh, reactive, what we could find out, uh, you know, by, uh, by proactive, these analytics uh, find it out for us. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for example, if we have identified this is a uh, no man zone, okay, it means nobody can enter. As soon as somebody enters in that no man zone, we will get an alert on our, uh, uh, we have created a, uh, you know, a 2D map of the refinery. So exactly by clicking on that alarm, we know, okay, you know, which location has generated. So immediately, you know, we can direct our QRT, uh, quick response team to that area, you know, uh, and we can guide them. Uh, and importantly, our QRT is also the GPS enabled uh, coming on this 2D map. So we see, you know, the object uh, which has generated the alarm and the QRT, they are going into the same direction. Otherwise, it should not happen. The QRT reached to the site, then they realize the object, okay, it has moved to some other direction, then we keep on guiding and talking. So we see both the movements on our 2D map. So this is one of the example, you know, how this video analytics has, uh, you know, is uh, help, helping us currently. Uh, third aspect I would like to mention about, uh, uh, which is a, uh, for any digital thing, in my opinion, it's a quick win, is uh, robotic process automation. You know, it's a, uh, uh, you identify a twin process and um, in a, uh, one month or two months time, you can make any process uh, live and people really see the benefit. Okay, it's not a long drawn, uh, you know, uh, uh, project. Uh, and uh, once you keep educating people about uh, the new process, they come with the idea, why can't you do this? So that's what we have uh, initiated in uh, HML. Uh, another project which is worth to mention is about, uh, uh, it's not that, okay, industrial inter internet of things is a new to the oil and gas uh, 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 as a refiner. We work with a lot of sensors, but we have introduced, uh, you know, uh, new acoustic based uh, sensors for uh, PSVs, our pressure safety wall, because if passe happens, okay, then it, 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 we have the order and the environmental problem. So with those acoustic sensors, we get the real-time efforts, uh, real-time alerts to the panel, to the operator panel, and then he can take you know, corrective action then and there. 
otherwise been passed you know the passer used to happen and then when person goes for the physical round only then he would be knowing you know what's all uh, what all is happening so with this kind of a real time uh, 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 alert you know you can attend the problem and they can do uh, you know the less damage uh, to the environment and importantly with this you know some of our units have also become the network see in the oil and gas or refinery or for and for that matter the new age technologies you know the challenge is you know how to get the network you shown to the steel industry the real time location system you know where somebody has put uh, 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 the object and uh, you know you are tracking it so unless until you are uh, maybe that's a indo particular unit what you have selected that's a indoor one okay uh, where you want to track but in oil and gas in refinery where uh, the uh, units are not fenced so how you will identify you know uh, this person supposed to be uh, uh, meant to be working in this particular area not to other units etc so uh, this network is helping us in um, uh, we are also doing a project the similar project it, we are calling it a real time location system for one of the unit by which you know as soon as you are in that particular um, uh, unit you can click uh, generate the alarm if you are in a, some emergency situation you have mustering you know the exact location of the person where uh, you know uh, uh, that person is and as i said it has created the entire unit one unit has become the network so you be in any corner of that particular um, uh, unit you have the wifi network which we are using for uh, our operator data round uh, for our asset performance uh, uh, management so that's what uh, this project we are doing uh, another project uh, you know, on the first principle based uh, you know, analytics uh, we are doing on to optimize our energy which is like a steel industry it's a huge cost for us as well you know very very significant cost a small optimization on the energy side so uh, and on the process side so these are the two real time process optimization and the energy optimization which is uh, not exactly you know by ai and uh, ml but the first principle based uh, analytics uh, and uh, as i said uh, uh, our idea is not to introduce the technology we don't want we are not a technology company we are uh, uh, into the oil business so the uh, each technology should solve some problem it's not that okay you know we feel pride in that okay we have this technology we feel pride when the technology solves some uh, uh, problem so each use case and each business case been prepared to uh, uh, solve the problem. Uh, very nice very well summarized actually yes it should be Uh, uh more about business benefits or solving business problems rather than just being a tech shop uh and in the example that you provided about tracking etc looks like or sounds like um, fbi tracking uh some people or suspects etc but yeah that qrt team example that you provided it's uh, very interesting thanks a lot i take forward the same question to uh to richard Uh, Mr. Richard Kusuma, could you please tell us about your experiences of what technologies you have used in your uh, manufacturing area, and then if for for what particular use cases and what benefits you have seen so far? Yeah, sure, Nicholas. Uh, thank you for your time. I mean, uh, it's basically Foodex is the 25 years old company in Indonesia, and then we do uh, seasonings and ingredients. One of the largest uh, food processing in Indonesia that we do a local market and also to export. at the nutshell is basically we process thousands of raw materials that we source globally yeah so we source from uh, india china and anywhere part of the world then we will further process in indonesia then from this raw materials basically we will come up with about hundreds of uh, finished products these finished products we will deliver it to our customers basically in noodle snack processed meat uh, hotel restaurant cafe uh, then they will further process into their uh, manufacturing so by having this uh, basically all the automation in the communication this is what is what we install right now in foodex so 25 years in the in the industry we finally move into automation where we uh, just installed and successfully launched the sales force where is combined between the uh, sales team and then also r&d this is to have a easier communication yeah so all projects will go filter out into that uh, sales channel then we are currently right now in the process to move to a hana sap uh, this is to communicate between the front office and the back office so this is we want to have that the link uh, clear communication and also updates to the whole team so to be honest with you uh, what is the benefit of having automation or 4.0 uh, is for us this is more into a leveraging a communication that we have right now 
Yeah. So from the projects, updates, and then also whatever the uh, win or the loss that we have, uh, we can have that on the same page between all the front end and then the back end people. The successful story is basically during 2020, during pandemic, we successfully uh, acquired our FSSC 22,000. As you maybe know, FSSC is the highest uh, safety food standard and is one of the highest uh, level that we can achieve in food industry. And because of this automation, then finally we able to you know, easily monitor and then progress to get the approval for the FSSC. What's next is basically what we will do, we will be start playing with the big data and then we start playing with the IoT and then we start to have those uh, internet of things. We want to leverage the data that we share to our customers. We will try to uh, study it internal, yeah? We start to study it internal so we can have a good pattern that this pattern we will able to create a food trend that we will be able to share with our partners. So this will be more interesting that uh, we can have a more study in depth with the result. So this is what I can share with you for our uh, current operation. Very nice. Thank you, sir, for, for, for providing this additional perspective about food and beverages industry, which is uh, a very important part of process manufacturing. And now that we are talking to you, Richard, uh, can you please take it one step forward and tell us what kind of methodology do you adopt? How should a company do innovations for Industry 4.0? Is it like you do pilots first and then full-scale rollouts? And what are the stage gates for approvals? Uh, what kind of methodology are you using? Well, my, my team is basically just go a uh, uh, big bang. Yeah, They just uh, try to roll it out. Of course, the, the first step, we will have the management meetings that the management direction uh, we want to move from 3.0 to a 4.0. Then from there, then basically we will try to get the leaders in the companies, which is some of them are directors, some of them are managers and supervisor level. Then we will try to communicate with them what will be the next step of moving forward. So from there, we will set the uh, clear roadmap or the blueprint. So this is to make sure that we will have a good uh, base. Uh, what is the target or the uh, end of the chain, uh, end of the lightning? So from there is basically we will try to communicate with the operator level because the head and the feet must work together. Yeah, Otherwise, uh, this uh, 4.0 or whatever technology we will install, it will, it will not work. So having a bigger picture and then also operator to operate the machines, I think this is very, very important. So this is what currently we are uh, implementing with the HANA also. So that is the steps that we are doing right now. Very nice. Okay, thanks a lot. And I take this question forward to Mr. Manoj Kumar. What methodology have you adopted? Do you do like stage-wise adoption of technologies? Uh, yeah, Nikhil. So for us, you know, uh, as I said, the seven new age digital technology, what we have introduced and the concept as we want to be the purpose driven that we want to touch and feel uh, uh, the technology first. So by which we are doing the, uh, I will not, uh, call it as a POC. We, I'll say the use case. The use case. We show it uh, to the our user, and then we scale it up. Okay, and then there are checks at every stage. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the you know gate stage, we evaluate ourselves the way we have introduced or the part process what we have selected or the you know normally we call it the uh, performance guarantee. Okay, you know the way we have thought whether it has resulted the same thing or uh, we had missed something. So there's a reason, you know, we we uh, the contextualization in HTML environment is more important. Uh, uh, what I have realized from my experience is, you know, people would like to see what we have done. Then adaptability is more. Of course, we can, uh, as in IT and in some other digital champion, they can clue of what all happening, uh, you know, uh, around the world, and we can learn from the peer industry sector or from our OEM also. But more adaptation come when we show to our user this is done in HTML. So that's right. how, you know, it helps us in the scaling up. So that's the methodology what we are adopting. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, that methodology is very important because uh, uh, I was discussing with Andrew last time and we were also thinking about there are so many POCs happening, okay, in every company, but very few of them actually get rolled out uh, to a full scale adoption uh, in the organization. So there must be a methodology. Every organization will need to develop it. But uh, uh, 
uh, there would be some basic principles on checking value and feasibility uh, at every stage. And now that takes me to the next uh, related question to Andrew. Uh, and what, uh, what principles or what methods have you used for uh, ROI justification, benefits assessment and evaluation beforehand, especially considering that many of these technologies are nascent, nobody would have used or tried them in the past. So to justify to the management to invest into it, there must be some method behind this madness. It's a great question and potentially it's one of the critical success factors for companies and whether they're able to, to get moving successfully. Now, what I would say is this is partially dependent on the level of maturity in a company about you know, how well they do business improvement, how well they do transformation. If we're putting together a business case just for Industry 4.0 and a couple of selected technologies, maybe there's a few tactical benefits around that, but that's not going to be the business case that then sustains you over a multi-year journey. When we've done this successfully at a couple of the mining companies I've worked for is we've put together the Industry 4.0 you know, strategy that maybe the technology team worked on with the business. We put it together with our broader business improvement approach and our transformation approach. And that allows us to then, particularly in process industries, you know, have a look at where the business is currently performing now, what's the full potential of the business, and identify a top-down gap that then says, if we can operate our business at its full potential, then what value do we have at stake here? And we can carve that up into a few different pieces. And one of those important pieces will be technology enabled change that comes from industry 4.0 technologies. Because what we want here is to be able to have a business case methodology that's not just something we do get signed off and then we put on the the shelf, this is a live document and a live model that helps us understand, you know, as we try, we maybe fail a few times, we learn, we create new ideas, we want to continually be looking at how do we address, if you like, that gap between where we're performing and where we could be performing. So we're basically managing it as a portfolio of improvement initiatives. And we want to be able to be honest with ourselves about our hard cash benefits or real cash in the bank, okay? Our soft cash benefits, you know, being a business improvement person, we, we generally use theory of constraints. So in process industries, we may identify some great initiatives, but it may be not in the primary constraint. So therefore, we may improve throughput through the secondary constraint, but it doesn't get us, say, more production, more tonnes, you know, through our or total leaders, whatever our business is, through our value chain. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it because we want to keep on improving to make sure that secondary constraint doesn't ever end up as the primary constraint. Same with productivity improvements. A lot of soft benefits. We save 20 minutes a shift for a particular worker. Great. But if we still have the same amount of people coming through our turnstile, into our factory every day, then you know we've improved productivity, but we haven't lowered costs. So it's you know hard cash, soft cash. We need to do some enablers. Could be around data quality and master data, and we can't ever forget you know our risk compliance and also our social license to operate projects. So we just want a mature methodology that's clear as to what kind of benefit we're going to deliver and then run each of our initiatives, you know, after a top-down business case to say, we think this, you know, there's tens of millions of dollars potentially at stake here, and then have the right disciplined approach where each initiative goes through that business case or valuation engine, and not only to get approved, but to track the whole way through implementation through to benefits, okay? And that really needs to be part of the company's DNA. You know, it gets into your planning processes about, 
you know, this year I can produce 20 million tonnes, but then from my portfolio, I've got 1.5 million extra tonnes coming through from my improvement initiatives. Well, I really need another 2 million, so therefore I need to go find some more initiatives. So we embed it into our planning processes, we embed it into our other, other ways of doing business. So it's, I'm trying to describe, you know, what a successful company does with a live business case, if you like, and a live valuation model, that it, it, it's running literally every week. And it's not just, a, here's something that the technology folk put together, the executive committee signed it off, they gave us a couple of million dollars worth of capital, and then we forget about it. That's, that's kind of the wrong approach, uh, you know, hoodwinking management into thinking that's a good idea, as opposed to, you know what, let's work together the whole business improvement or transformation portfolio for a single view of change in your business um, and, and, and really get Industry 4.0 as part of that change agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Very useful, very valuable insights, especially uh, the way you have explained hard cash and soft cash, at least personally for me, it's a very good learning. We always thought of benefits as financial benefits or technical benefits, uh, but that, that's a very good way of explaining this entire thing. Um, and, and while we are talking to you, Andrew, let's continue on uh, the aspect related to adoption by people or human beings i mean in your in those organizations what steps have been taken to take care of people aspects in sure. industry 4.0 so it's a great topic nick hill but what i would do is slightly rephrase the question or the problem to be solved so if we come along with a technology mindset of we've got some kind of widget to implement and i need people you know to be able to change with that I think we've got the right wrong kind of model in place. And if I use one of the drone and inspection robot projects I did, um, I picked it up from the IT folk and that's exactly the approach they're taking of, I've got this piece of technology uh, of, of some drones and some tele remote inspection robots. Uh, and I need to do the appropriate, you know, people change management around that. I would take a broader perspective to think of how are we going to change the business? What processes are we going to redesign? How are we going to co-design these with the people in the business? How are we going to reimagine something new and different? And it's not so that we've got a mindset of building something more from an IT perspective. We build it to give it to support to operate. This is actually a, more of what we use in asset management to build new plants around operational business readiness. How are we going to make this change, or you know, if you like, design to operate? And think through, sure, there's people and skill issues here 100%, but if I haven't redesigned the process, you know, I'm just automating the same old way that we used to do. I need to think through the holistic change, my HSC risks, you know, doing job hazard assessments, the sorts of tasks. How am I going to change the operating procedures? Do I need to change my, you know, control system with different set points in the control system? Do I need to set up inside SAP? Um, so I've got drones, I've got inspection robots, they need maintenance tactics, they need spare parts. We need a bill of materials for those spare parts inside SAP. Do I need permits from the regulator? Do I need to change people's roles? Because it's not, this is an asset I'm potentially going to have to operate 24 by 7, 365 days a year. So, yes, the people aspect's important, but we need to kind of move on a little to that more and more sort of holistic operational business readiness mindset of a lot of the time we're going to put assets into production here. And we're going to have to think of how we're going to operate them Smart people, you know, upskilling our people, yes, working with smart machines, but it's, you know, many of those other elements go together to make sure we're going to manage that holistic change uh, so that when we need that service, you know, in this case, it's an on-demand inspection uh, drone inspection robot that's going to talk to the cloud and send LiDAR images off to the cloud for interpretation and get it back to a human um, for them to make a judgment on a pipeline uh, or, or another critical asset. So I think it's a, we've got a lot of work to do here and, yeah. and we take more of a mindset of we're changing how the business operates 
and the people are one important aspect of it, but it's that holistic uh, change approach, uh, more taken from a, if you like, a broader asset management perspective, I think uh, companies need to be thinking about. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Very, very uh, important insights on people management part. Manoj, uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar, I will not ask you this question because it will steal the thunder from your presentation. You are going to present on this topic. Let me move to uh, Richard. Richard, could you please share your insights about how you have handled the people aspects in your organization for new technologies? Well, the, the, as I mentioned to you, uh, we have been in the industry 25 years and then we start moving to uh, automation, I think about uh, the last 10 years. Yeah. So the biggest uh, shock is a culture shock where we move from paper-based into uh, uh, automation-based, which is a gadget-based. So this is the generation gap. That is one of the problem right now that we have. And I think uh, slowly it's being ironed out where people are on the older generation still comfortable using a hand signature. So, but now they are being pushed to have automation from their gadget. So that's one of the uh, hurdle that we have. But uh, I'm still thankful. Basically all the uh, commercial team is still moving forward to, to be an agile organization. As I mentioned to you, uh, we are moving in using uh, one of the sales uh, technology. So we have the capability to view all our transaction online, uh, where we're able to uh, approve uh, all the stuff online also, and then get all the feedback online. So we can be on the faster pace right now. So this uh, faster communication, we will be able to implement or be able to communicate to our customers. So by doing this, it's basically is moving the organization faster. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, taking, uh, going back to the previous question, what are your tips and tricks and guidance to the audience here on how to convince the management to invest into new technologies? Do you use any particular methodology for business case and ROI justifications? I think that my boss just SMS you to ask you this question. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically <laughs> ROI is very important. And then that's always the uh, case from... based on we present and then from there basically we we will be able to present where we at now should be uh, apart from the uh, next level so from there uh, we will try to make some study case uh, a concrete study case basically uh, why we should invest in such an operation or such a machine or something like that then from there my boss will ask me how much sales you can bring back when we when we install that machine or we invest that uh, technology and how are we make sure that the program that we installed is working is very simple is as long as the program is running better and faster and giving a less headache, basically the program is quite successful. So that is the uh, uh, criteria that we are getting at right now. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, very useful. Uh, we move to the next question and uh, question is to Jeff and, and Manoj uh, Narang. Uh, what new technologies do you see in future coming into play or becoming more and more prominent for industry 4.0. Jeff? Yeah, um, just looking at the time we have, I'll try to keep it, uh, keep it brief. And I think it's, um, um, maybe it's more around, not necessarily a, a specific technology, but I think it was touched upon by Manoj, Richard and Andrew is, um, is, is the technology that, that can support the change. Um, from the business process side of it. And I mean, in, in the process from whether we manage our recipes through how do we plan our sales, through manufacturing, through logistics, through, through maintenance, I mean, that's, there are no silos in the business process. However, most organizations are still set up um, in silos. So I think one of them is how do, you, how do you look at your business differently? How do you let your technology enable um, the cross business process um, to break down those silos? So almost think of it as intercompany collaboration 
um, however, whatever technology that is. So I think that's one aspect. I think the other one is, um, and I think a critical one, especially when we talk about resilience in supply chain and resilience in your business is, is externally. So how do you collaborate with your suppliers? How do you, what are those relationships globally in the region? Um, as well as taking that all the way to your logistics providers. So if you have um, enough, enough product available, but you have logistics capacity, well, that's an issue in your overall business. Um, and then Andrew talked about the, the maintenance side of it. What are my maintenance strategies um, to maintain these assets? But it's not just internally. How do I collaborate with, my, with the OEMs that are providing it um, an external workforce, a, a contingent contract workforce. So I guess in kind of summary, it's the technology I'd look at in two layers. One is how does it facilitate the um, intercompany collaboration to break down the silos? And I think you'll see a trend which is here now, but it will increase in the, in the next um, you know, three, five years is um, that business relationship outside of your own organization and in, in the world of networks. Very nice. And, and Manoj Kumar, I hope you're okay if we take a few extra minutes from your presentation type so that uh, we can bring it to a logical conclusion. No, sure, uh, sure, sure. Okay, so same question to uh, Manoj Naran. Could you please share your insights on what will be the new technologies of future for Industry 4.0? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Nikhil. I think uh, as Jeff just told, certainly breaking down silos to uh, be more connected. But I also want to say that, you know, manufacturing has to move from industry 4.0 perspective into more predictive domain, uh, utilization of technologies to uh, innovate, to make it more predictive process control, very specifically, which I see in many, uh, you know, companies uh, because of the uh, kind of the process control, which is required to know what parameters to be maintained to get a particular required quality. That's a very important domain, which I see, uh, which a lot of customers doing. There is, uh, we generate a lot of process data, whether it is time series data, whether it is quality data and business data, but then analysis and getting the useful insight from it and going back to, let's say, business systems. That is what is going to be very important. And companies uh, have to, uh, if I say, make sense of this data, putting intelligent technologies on top of it. That's another thing. So if I say, you know, a very, very important point, becoming more predictive in manufacturing, be be becoming more data, uh, you know, learning from data and putting that into business systems. That's two things which I see in top of what Jeff uh, talked about. Thank you. Nikhil, I guess we cannot hear you. Yeah, well, I cannot hear you. Uh, I'm saying the essence of the entire discussion is that there are several technologies and, and, and like Andrew mentioned, LIDAR, drones, robotics, and uh, earlier you mentioned about big data and RPA, et cetera. There are plenty of technologies, but it's more about utilization and how uh, a company leverages them for business benefits, solving business problems. There are several questions in the uh, Q&A uh, panel over here. Uh, we won't have time to uh, take all of them, but I would request all the uh, participants to please stay, be in touch with uh, either of the panelists uh, or with me and we'll forward those questions to the uh, appropriate panelists. But before moving to the uh, next presentation by Mr. Manoj Kumar, a last question to any of the panelists here. This question is coming again and again in the Q&A panel, and it's about how uh, are you taking care of cybersecurity? Because with so much of technology and, and openness, there must be something which we would be doing, especially with this uh, uh, ransomware attack on this uh, pipeline in the US uh, recently. Anybody would like to go for it? Yeah, Nikhil, maybe I'll take, you know, uh, the cybersecurity is a big, big item. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we all are talking about connecting things, connecting people, connecting the data, generating more data, generating, you know, put more network. And, uh, you know, it is getting more open for cyber uh, uh, theft, cyber security. In my opinion, it should be, uh, it should not be retrofit. Okay, it should be conceptualized from the day one. It should be part of your project. But normally what happens and, uh, uh, you know, we start something and then we try to retrofit, uh, you know, uh, the cyber. And especially I would say in the OT area, in IT, I would say it's a bit matured. People are moving towards, uh, you know, the cloud and a bit maturity is there. 
but in operation technology because of the oems in that particular area i think it's a you know a bit weakness and today what in the transformation what we are talking major transformation in the ot area where we are opening various firewalls to generate the data of the shop floor and making it to available on the cloud or the, on the on, on the big data so i think the cyber security is a key aspect we all should be uh, uh, worried and uh, it's, uh, and again for the sake of repetition rather than retrofitting uh, you know uh, once we complete the project it should be introduced from the inception of the project okay so it should be taken care of in the design stage itself rather than uh, a reactive thing uh, last bit from you richard what are, what is your organization doing uh, from cyber security point of view well we are also now moving to cloud yeah so some of it we are using it still offline uh security that we protect only certain people that able to access it and then some of them uh we try to expose it online or or connected so that's what we are doing right now okay thank you so much so once again i would like to thank the panelists it was extremely uh good invaluable input that you provided how i wish or next time we will have a one hour uh, panel discussion so that we have more time uh we we will now move to the next session which is a presentation by mr manoj kumar who is the head of it for hkmel hpcl mithal energy limited which is an uh, downstream oil refining company based out of india uh the theme here is that we have uh, so far uh, been mostly talking about technology but uh, we we very rarely discuss about the people aspects because the employees have fear of technology fear of losing jobs apprehensions about how their roles will change how they will upskill themselves with the new technologies and that's why we thought it will be very useful to have this topic uh, in in our web conference today because uh, it's often untouched but it's really vital so once again thanks a lot to all the panelists and we'll move to the next presentation by uh, manoj so naz could you please take over Yeah, hi Nikhil. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. So thanks, Nikhil, uh, for having me here to give the people aspect of industry 4.0 or on the digital transformation side. Uh, for before I start, uh, just an introduction of uh, the company I represent. Uh, ours is a joint venture company between Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited and Mittal Energy Investment Pt Limited. uh we uh, produce 80% is our liquid products and 20% as a solid product and we are a integrated uh, petrochemical complex uh, and the capacity of our refinery is 11.3 million metric ton uh, per annum and we own our own pipeline of 1070 1017 kilometers uh, from gujarat to rajasthan to punjab is basically the northern part of um, uh, india and we have our own captive power plant of 165 uh, megawatt and uh, at this point of time our own employee strength is 1900 people with uh, various background as a, as any company would like to create the value for uh, their shareholders uh, for uh, their uh, partner ecosystem their customers for the society we at hml also have that vision that okay we want to create value in our oil business as well as our upcoming petrochemical business using the digital technology and how we want to achieve this by enhancing the financial performance enhancing the customer value and enhancing the societal value we believe these are the main uh, uh, driver or main pillar for us to achieve that vision and what is our strategy model so strategy model is our strategy model or strategy pillars are based on the three i concept what we call is improvement integration and innovation so when i talk talk about the improvement it means the foundation system on which we all have done the heavy investment whether it is a erp system in the, in our case it's a sap various manufacturing execution system various other enterprise system you know that holds the key and the investment i strongly believe what we have done holds good today also it does not mean they got outdated you need to continuously do improvement and they will continuously do value for you so that's the reason i feel the first tie is very very important you can't ignore your foundation system at a cost of new digital technologies 
second i is about integration as more and more data is getting captured everybody would like to see information for themselves at one place nobody would like to enter the data twice so we believe the integration is key if we really want to transform the third i is about innovation we believe and we have selected these seven technologies which will create innovation for us advanced analytics industrial internet of things mobility robotic process automation chatbots ar vr and the drone related technologies so these are the seven technologies what we believe that can create an uh, innovation and as i mentioned in my panel discussion we are not here to introduce the technology technology should be contextualized in your respective organization so that they can solve some problem and in terms of you know digital transformation what are the objectives or the pillars for us is operation excellence we want to optimize our yield energy and throughput we want to avoid unplanned breakdowns we want to create value for safety and environment by enhancing more safety and handling efficiently the environment related issues we want to create the workplace 2.0 where more and more uh, process we want to automate so that our workforce pay attention or are engaged in more productive activity rather than the routine activity and the customer excellence by increasing their experience whether it is on the supply side or their own expectation that's what uh, you know we are planning to do achieve in our digital transformation we in the panel discussion also we discussed you know what should be the methodology we should be doing all the project at the same time or uh, you know uh, we should be doing small so at hmel since that the, we have the new age digital technology and they are different from the package software so the methodology what we have said let's assess and educate it means let's assess you know what may make sense for hmel okay and educate more and more people in the organization because people from the business side they need to introduce to these new tools and so that they come up with the idea how these new age tools can solve the business problem then as a next step we identify the process for the proof of concept or as a pilot i would say to uh, by using those technology we complete those proof of concept or the pilot and once we are successful based on the, based on the requirement we scale it up so there's a four step uh, methodology we are adopting for our uh, transformation and uh, as i said you know these are the diff technologies are different from the package traditional package software so uh, unless until user or the business function they see uh, uh, from their own hand some technology working for some other, some function in hml they don't believe it so seeing is a belief so there's a reason the conducting the pilot is important before scaling it up so few of the technologies what uh, or the uh, you know the landmark project what we have done uh, using uh, video analytics for our integrated physical security system uh, putting our acoustic sensors for our psv cvs uh, and uh, uh, the real time location system uh, various mobile applications we have launched virtual reality some uh, training modules we have developed using uh, 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 mobility and the plant logistic management system where we want to uh, end to end the internal logistics you know uh, we, we would be managing it using plant logistic management system and the asset performance management including the operator data round where uh, people go to the round instead of more, uh, taking the parameters or uh, various parameters of the machines on paper they are doing it on on, on the tabs and the data data is automatically transferred to the respective system so these are the some of the you know technology what we have introduced and uh, we uh, touched about the cyber security implementation and we are uh, uh, paying equal attention the cyber security on the uh, ot side before starting any project so we discuss you know uh, 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 the agenda for today uh, uh, presentation is about the people so in my opinion uh, in any digital transformation or industry 4.0 whatever we call it okay it is more about the people less about technology we can debate you know what percentage we should allow to people and the technology and the process but it is more towards people so do we have the resistance or do we have the support okay so let me give you the perspective both the perspective in my opinion today the c suite people the top management people they are really aligned they want to introduce the new digital tool or industry 4.0 in their respective organization and they strongly believe that it can create the value so in my opinion the top 
management is really aligned. The lower management is really enthusiastic because they are the passed out from the college, recently passed out or quite young. So they have experience, they have used various gadgets, application on the technology, on the, and they are, you know, the technology freak. So they are really enthusiastic that how those technology can solve, you know, day-to-day -day problem. So they are really enthusiastic about it. And the digital awareness, it has really, really increased, which is helping us the rolling out of the solution quickly. Today, in any business function, it's not that okay, in the IT webinar or you know, or on the OT, OEMs uh, webinar, you hear about the technology. If you go to any business functions webinars or uh, uh, seminars, you know, you hear more about the digital side. It means the the buzzword is well uh, accepted, and people know that okay, these are the tools, and they should be using it. So these are in terms of you know the support. What uh, from the human per se we are getting in the organization. That's what my belief is. And where is the resistance? The resistance first in terms of the ownership, who is the owner? It is from the business side, IT side, OT side, who is the owner? And especially most of the projects on this transformation side, it is cross-functional. So getting a single owner from the business side is a challenge. So I think the ownership still is a challenge in my opinion. From the middle management per se also, you know, they are fully not aligned you know, to carry out the vision of the top management. I think I still see, you know, the resistance to change, some kind of a fear, you know, whether we would be successful or not. I think as a middle management, still I see the lack of appetite. Third is, you know, instead of, you know, working for our organization and looking the holistic view of the organization, people look for the digital solution for the, from the break fix or very silo approach. So rather than you know looking from the very very uh, 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 optimally for the organization, they look from a break fix what is for them. Okay, so I think these are some of the resistance uh, in my opinion for industry 4.0. Uh, Manoj, sorry to interrupt. We have only about ten minutes. So. Yeah, I'll uh, uh, try to wrap up in ten minutes. So from the employee attitude towards uh, AI and ML, I think uh, AI and ML has. Uh, spoken a lot, abused a lot. So uh, uh, it is well aware in the industry that okay, what AI and ML uh, uh, can uh, can do, and at every level people are aware of, of, about it. And important reason is why they are aware because they are using it in their personal capacity. And just global management and learning new things is also a motivation. People take pride when they say I am working on a project which uh, which uh, which are using the AI and ML of the world. You know, so they are really enthusiastic and it works as a motivation factor for them. And where the resistance come, the first, it always starts, it cannot be done. And we talk about the team play, etc. It comes when we feel, you know, the, uh, when we see the hope. But initially, it will always be, it cannot be done. Second, in the middle management, you know, the solution is not a problem. When you go to the identification of the problem, you know, then the first thing come, either it's a, the problem is so simple, let's not use it AI ML, or they will give you the extreme problem which cannot be solved in a, you know, uh, uh, with, with reference to the cost, money, and the time you have, it cannot be solved. So either you, you, you don't settle for in between, that okay, let's start to have some mid-level problem using this technology. So extreme of both, whether too easy or too difficult, in my opinion, it's a bad way uh, to start this kind of a project. The third, in terms of expectation, where it seems you, uh, you know, this buzzword is so uh, abused or, you know, it has been uh, educated or that everything will be done by the AI and ML. In my opinion, it is not. You know, it will take its own time. 100% expectation that it will be done by AI and ML. I think it's a wrong expectation. It will evolve. It needs continuous monitoring, con continuous modeling. So it will take its own time. So uh, rather than, you know, expecting that, okay, 100% it will be done by AI and ML. I think that also work as a constraint uh, towards AI and ML. In terms of uh, awareness, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a key requirement for the adoption and for the transformation, uh, top to down approach. The you know the regular update also requires a two suite or that you know at the, the top level also what all is happening. We need to keep on promoting uh, the innovative ideas, and the idea should not remain idea. They should people should be seeing some uh, execution on the ideas. Otherwise, they will not be uh, they will not be generating the new ideas. And I strongly believe a good partner ecosystem is also important where, you know, you have a limited view, but your partner system, they work with multiple, uh, uh, multiple companies, so they can give you the good perspective what all is happening. 
so we need to promote a good partner ecosystem and recognize and appreciate your employees sometimes uh, you know uh, appreciation and the recognition it works more than money you know uh, in in this kind of approach in terms of convincing uh, you know uh, ad adoption of the industry 4.0 i think it, people are convinced that okay traditional problems can be solved and to further convincing you need to really need to engage the problem by identifying the digital champion in all the departments you know it is not that okay everybody is so digital savvy but you will have many you know find few people who are the re real you know uh, you, who can really be the digital champions okay and then you need to equip them with the right set of the tool also the tool also is important you cannot ignore the tool aspect if you know with the best of the people if the right tool is not there then they will not see the value and starting with a small also a good strategy let people see what happening in their respective organization using that technology so rather than you know making a big project or big initiative or big transformation you know a small transformation can lead to a big transformation in terms of a man manpower constraint yes skill is a challenge you know we need to reskill re upskill the people and then in my opinion you know the right set of attitude is important today we have the one technology technology will come and go but if you have the right set of the people okay you will be uh, you will be able to educate more to them you can leverage more to them because they will learn whatever technology comes uh, on the uh, on the way and adaptability of the new technological solution absolutely important people should be adopting they should be you know uh, using it it should not that okay you know you we have implemented and we are not using then it will not uh, yield into anything and the cultural acceptance of innovation a destination versus continuous journey approach where people see that okay this industry 4.0 it's a you know the destination it's a in my opinion it's a, a, a journey and everybody needs to uh, assume that okay you know 100% can't be achieved on the day one it will evolve and, uh, and and it's a journey in terms of the pandemic you know uh, we all are suffering from this uh, um, uh, covid so it is not that okay digital uh, was not there before pandemic but pandemic has uh, worked as a positive catalyst it means business side and the technology people they come together in a shorter span of time and they have believed yes it can be done and they have done it without giving you know getting too much time in the smallest time they have done it which has increased their belief and in my opinion that will that, that has laid down the path of post pandemic okay so uh, uh, pandemic has really worked as a positive catalyst in this transformation even people have come together they thought okay you know uh, it, it is for the smaller timeline smaller duration but i think uh, you know it will continue because people have seen the advantage of uh, using those technologies from the new workflow per se i believe you know uh, when we starting our project we need to keep in mind that uh, uh the new workflow will be there people need to change the way they are working so rather than you know fitting the technology on the existing process or existing uh, way of working you know we should be changing the way they are working using those technology but most of the time what happens we try to fit in the new technology in the existing work process rather than changing the work process so i think that uh, that insight needs to be there from the project uh, inception so that people are really working for redefining the existing work for, uh, flow and the processes of course a lot of resistance will come but effective change management can uh, you know overcome this problem from the human machine interface the single statement would like to make is you know hmi should work for the user not vice versa people are now sick of you know finding the information you know they are not uh, because n number of information they don't want to see they want to see the information what is meant for them and it should be super simple that your your grandmother can use you know that should be the super simple of uh, you know uh, the human machine interface the post implementation i think in the panel discussion also we have covered this topic that you know it is very very important exercise to know your standing where you are after the implementation what objective we have set and how we have achieved and what is a way forward in case we are not achieved the desired result so we should be having the you know the post performance or the past post implementation second aspect is you know uh, uh, at each organization they also need to take a risk they cannot run uh, you know these kind of a transformation pro uh, projects without taking any risk so they also need to take risk they will need to ensure that okay the partners uh, partners skin is also in the game but at the same time your skin also should not be game you cannot pass each and every risk to your partner so just to summarize the learning 
See, digital transformation is more about the people and the uh, uh, talent, uh, less about the uh, technology. With the best of the people, you know, uh, uh, we can adopt the good technology. And people, we really need the good cocktail of the people, process, and technology. We cannot undermine any of these uh, three components. Context of the organization is important. Some of the technology may be successful at X player, generated the millions of the uh, millions of the dollar. But we need to see in your organization context, you know, what uh, what is the problem, what is the magnitude of the problem, and what you can solve. So the contextualization of the organization is very very uh, important. We need to really prioritize based on the uh, value. Uh, you know, value in terms of uh, someone has used the soft cash or hard cash, you know, the, so uh, it depends on the situation, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, prioritize. And uh, and it's not necessary that, okay, you know, uh, 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 that, okay, you need to be innovate everywhere. So some companies have a culture of uh, fast failure. If you don't have that culture, it's okay, in my opinion. If you are the fast follower or fast follower, that is also equally good, okay? The last aspect for me is, you know, prioritize the solution, not the partner or uh, technology. The solution is important. Solution of the problem is important rather than a partner or um, technology in your own context. So that's what I believe. Uh, I think I've covered uh, 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 my time. Nikhil, if anybody has any question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Manoj. Uh, it's, it's uh, such valuable insights. Because as I said earlier, we are mostly talking about technology and less about people aspects, which are even more important than the technology in itself. We have uh, actually run out of time, so we can't take questions now, but there are lots of questions in Q&A panel. We will save those questions and then direct them to the uh, appropriate uh, panelist and presenter. So once again, thank you so much, Manoj, for this presentation. And thanks a lot to the panelists for sharing your uh, valuable insights they will be uh, useful for all the audience in my opinion and now i'll hand over to uh, nas to see if there is uh, you want to do any post uh, event uh, feedback question or would you like to do it later thanks once again thank you everyone thanks manash and Nikhil for the presentation and great discussion for the questions so we have come to the end of today's session Please join me in thanking all the all of the speakers. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our future editions of our iPad Connect series.